Um, we have Reed Robinson today on the New Health Club show, the co-founder and medical director of Cedar Psychiatry. Uh, he's also a founding board member at the Utah-based nonprofit Psychedelic Institute. So, of course, it's a very historic <laughs> moment in psychedelics, you could say, since two days. You're the mm -hmm. first one on the podcast after the... <laughs> The whole decrim thing seems to have exploded in the last um, two days. Uh, at least if you look at American media, this is the, the main headline is psychedelics or uh, at least mushrooms are the big winner of this election. So, of course, you are closer True. to this thing as we are. So how do you think about this? What's happening at the moment? Will psychedelics save America? That's our question to you. That is a very good question. And uh, I think they are well on their way. It's uh, interesting to me at, in this time of uh, suffering and when we're all in a bit of a mess, um, you know, politically, sometimes economically, and of course, with the global pandemic going on. But it's interesting and timely that psychedelics are emerging as a, as a tool of, of helping us wake up and uh, reconnect with ourselves with each other. Um, so I was I was excited about the Oregon mm -hmm. 109 measure in particular and what that means for the, the path forward. I think it accelerates the path to getting psychedelic medicine to the people who need it most. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but have you been involved with uh, other, de like the decrim, you could say almost movement before, or was it something that you just kind of, Paid, of course, you paid attention to it because you're in in that business. But I feel like people didn't expect that kind of success that people were actually voting or like wanted to have the possibility of doing psychedelic therapy. Yeah, and so I have been asked to sit on certain committees mm -hmm. about decriminalization out here in Utah, for example. But I must say my focus has been on getting psychedelic medicines into clinic. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm I'm certainly in favor of uh of undoing the unfortunate things that uh you know we as a country did to overschedule these medicines and make them too inaccessible. But but my focus is on the research and the clinical path to getting these medicines to the people. Mm -hmm. But I mean uh of course we want to talk about ketamine today or ketamine therapy, we should say more precisely. Yeah. So uh, you're one of the experts that um, becoming visible in the last couple of years. I mean, in America even faster than in Europe. So, and I think you had 2011, you did one, one of really important research study with ketamine, right? Yeah, that was my first, well, my first encounter with ketamine actually was during residency training, not even on a psychiatry rotation. Uh, of course, I encountered it during anesthesia rotations, but when I was working in a pediatric emergency room, finishing up my training, that's when I first gave ketamine, and it was to kids before they'd get sutures to help them hold still. But then as after I finished training, uh, I think it was around 2010 when some of the exciting pivotal studies came out uh, using ketamine as a rapid antidepressant. And so I, I embraced it early on. I was in a setting that allowed me to do that, working in a hospital in ICUs in, in an emergency room doing psychiatric consults. So I started giving it and uh, I was a, and I'm a clinical trialist. So I was approached by Johnson Johnson or mm -hmm. Janssen to do an IV ketamine for depression study back in 2011 and got to sit with people, numerous people during their ketamine journeys, asking them questions, really getting a feel for what this medicine is like and what it can do. What was your first, uh, yeah, I mean, impression? Because it's like almost up to 10 years ago where was psychedelics were not in any kind of I mean, classic media, which now has, of course, since the last two years has changed. So it must have been still something very 
well, fancy, <laughs> weird <laughs> to people mm -hmm. that uh, one yes. would research ketamine as a antidepressant. So, and how were your first? How was your first encounter? What people? How people reacted to it in terms of, um, yeah, psychedelic healing possibilities. Mm -hmm. Now it's a really great question because it is so different back then now compared to 10 years ago in terms of public perception and readiness. And so I must say that back then I was using ketamine more for its chemical properties mm -hmm. as a rapid antidepressant for its anti-suicidality um, effects. But now I focus almost exclusively on using ketamine and other tools along with psychotherapy. So I've I've since seen the uh, immense value in pairing it with psychotherapy and in adding in the the ceremonial and and ritual components that we draw from these indigenous pop populations that we can learn so much from. Mm -hmm. But can you? That's interesting. C can you explain that a little bit? Because this is obviously these components you just described. It seems that this is also the new way of using this. I mean, it's not even a real psychedelic, but in a therapeutical context. So I mean, maybe you just talk a little about how, let's say you're, you're a patient and you say, okay, I want to use this. I want to try this. I'm just trying it <laughs> as we speak. <laughs> I already oh, had, nice. yeah, I had, of course I have to do it because I have to know what I'm talking about, but I also do it because of personal reasons, but it's a very interesting, mm, let's say, uh, of course, experience, but but it's a whole new way of undergoing therapy, right? I mean, so maybe, but you, you talk a little bit about how a person, a patient coming in says he or she wants to do that, and then you go from there. So what do you do? You have like a you ask questions or you have like a like a kind of a screening so maybe you just talk a little bit in in the in the cedar psychiatry how you how you provide this or what's your strategy to to um to bring this to patients sure yeah i'd be happy to it it comes up as one of several tools uh, for treatment resistant depression for example mm -hmm. so the conversation usually comes up when an individual comes into clinic and they have depression or PTSD or OCD, maybe severe anxiety. I work a lot with eating disorders as well. Okay. Uh, so they come in, but their current treatment program is just not working adequately. They're still suffering. Uh, they're still in need of significant help. So that's when we'll often bring up ketamine as an option. Although more and more these days, people come in asking about it because of what, uh, the media has been doing, which I think is great in raising awareness about these options that are now available. Yeah, well, I mean, you have like articles in, what was it recently in Allure, actually, which was, mm -hmm. is kind of a beauty, uh, kind of a health beauty magazine for women. There was a really long article about a woman who she took antidepressants, but it didn't get better. So she heard about ketamine. So, and then yesterday was a big article in Invoke about how drugs are the like psychedelic therapy drugs are the big winner of 2020. So it seems to become like mm -hmm. a normality. But I mean, I think if you let's say if you Google it and you find some videos from Vice uh, about a guy who went to take part in a study at Yale. And he went to a daily ketamine therapy, but still, I think most people don't really have an idea yet how this will look like. So let's say you agree on a patient with a patient, okay, we would try ketamine therapy. So how often would the patient come in? And so what would be like a time frame that you offer, like like a couple of weeks, like months? So how is sure. your how is your procedure with this? Yeah. And and another component you mentioned that I think is really important is, of course, the medical screening. So yeah. as part of the, that initial discussion, we go through the individual's medical and psychiatric history and make sure mm -hmm. they're a good candidate for it because not everyone is. Uh, it is a, a safe and well-tolerated medicine. It's, uh, it has very good um, efficacy rates, mm -hmm. and it's also... Uh, not not for everyone. So 
from there, we'll go into a, a preparation session, usually mm -hmm. on a separate day to really provide psychoeducation, to till the soil for that first ketamine experience, talking about the intention. And uh, this is part of that ketamine-assisted psychotherapy protocol that we're talking about that has really emerged in recent years. But um, we'll typically give ketamine uh, about twice a week for the first two or three weeks mm -hmm. and then reevaluate, say one month in, reevaluate. There may have been three to six ketamine sessions already, and then we'll reevaluate how many should we do next? Are any more needed? If so, what interval? Uh, trying to find the, the least frequent interval, if it's even needed, that will help the person stay well. Mm -hmm. So, but I mean, it, it's interesting that, like, I mean, maybe you should also say this, that it doesn't really work like, for example, psilocybin or LSD, where you kind of would need still like the day after or the next two days after to really kind of... Uh, yeah, deal with your experience or you would still be, let's say, even you could say under the influence. But with ketamine, it's like after 15 minutes when the IV um, is actually has left or like the, the whole substance has left your system um, and the IV has stopped like 15 minutes later, you feel completely normal again. I mean, you might be a little dizzy, but you're not like you can fix yourself like something to eat or you can just walk the streets, you can watch a TV show. Um, and I find that really interesting because it could be, and this is why I was so interested also in trying it as for, for my own therapy, that you could just really use it yeah. in the moment you have the therapy to access other information that you would not have in a normal talk therapy. So um, mm -hmm. is that something you you already kind of looked at in your study, like what people are actually seeing and what kind of parts of the brain are activated mm -hmm. while you're on ketamine? Yeah, it's there are a lot of good points there. Uh, ketamine is fundamentally different in how it works compared to classic psychedelics mm -hmm. like LSD and psilocybin. But I do strongly believe that there's a window of opportunity there. There is a neuroplasticity that results after taking this medicine, and that's uh, well published in the scientific literature for mm -hmm. ketamine, as it is for uh, classic psychedelics. And so I strongly believe that we should use that window of opportunity for a psychotherapy session in the one to two days that follow. Um, so, so in my practice, I'll do that preparation session. And when the individual comes in, we'll do some pre-dose therapy. Mm -hmm. um, we'll do some kind of meditation, some breath work, mm -hmm. some intention setting. And then I use ketamine by intramuscular injection um, nearly, well, most of the time. We'll do IV sometimes. We'll do lozenges, nasal sprays. Uh, but I just like the IM delivery mechanism intramuscular. Mm -hmm. And then uh, afterwards, we'll talk about it. We'll spend, say, half an hour debriefing um, if the indiv individual is up for it, and then have them come back the next day, ideally for a therapy session. Mm -hmm. So that means you don't, you, what you use is you don't have like an infusion. You just, is it just like, just, just to understand it. So it's like an injection or something like that? Yeah, okay. I give mm -hmm. an injection into the shoulder, mm -hmm. and it's a smooth trajectory. It still lasts about 30 to 45 okay. minutes. It comes on within a minute or two. The individual, we give them uh, headphones, eye shades, in a, in a recliner, a comfortable private setting with a, a nurse or medical assistant monitoring and the uh, prescriber and or therapist there, a uh, caregiver or family member, mm -hmm at their side if that makes sense to them and uh yeah and then after that uh they just take off the eye shades take off the headphones and uh and say just like just like i think you mentioned initially wow that was that was strange it's hard to put yeah. words on it yeah but i mean i find mostly fascinating by myself for, for myself is that it's like you're in such a different state and then like 15 minutes later, you're like, well, did anything happen? Like, <laughs> it's like, but then of course, <laughs> a lot of things have happened and you've seen a lot of um, 
yeah, people, pictures, moments, feelings that you mm -hmm. would not see otherwise just in, in talk therapy. Um, and they, of course, they still stay with you, even if your whole body or your system is not kind of dizzy anymore, you have to lie down or everything. So, and, um, mm -hmm. and, and I was asking myself, is this something, so the, obviously you come out of the experience and you, you keep thinking about what you've seen or experienced. Uh, is this another kind of, um, let's say, setup in your brain than the setup after psilocybin or LSD? Like, and how is it different? How is your brain different on ketamine? Yeah, that's a really good question. <laughs> so ketamine, you know, the classic psychedelics work through these serotonergic receptors mostly. Mm -hmm. And uh, by nature, they have more insight uh, that comes along with it. Uh, so ketamine is a hallucinogen. I do consider it a, a mm -hmm. psychedelic, and it's been known for decades. Uh, but I, th to me, that means we have to work a little bit harder with ketamine to make meaning of the experience mm -hmm. and to draw insights from that experience, not just because ketamine is brief, or briefer than say ayahuasca or psilocybin or LSD, mm -hmm. but also because of uh, how it works in the brain with its uh, glutamate receptor mechanism, mm -hmm. with with the uh, neuroplasticity um, that it facilitates, and it does uh, it gives us this window of opportunity to do deeper therapeutic work. It helps people move through difficult emotions. It helps uh, the individual see with a new perspective, maybe revisit past traumas in a way that isn't so activated and uh, stressed out. And we can get into any of these mechanisms if you'd like, or even some stories of people's experience. Yeah, sure. I mean, if you, if you have some stories or like, like an example you could, you could talk about, that would be great. Yeah. I, I just completed a, uh, a ketamine study in clinic uh, of a new specific ketamine therapy modality we're developing called emotion focused mm -hmm. ketamine assisted psychotherapy. And this was an eating disorder study, individuals with anorexia. And one young lady was getting her second ketamine treatment, and uh, her intention that she set going into it was around unconditional love and learning to love herself mm -hmm. uh, because she was really stuck in a self critical mode. Um, and when she came out of that, she took her headphones off, uh, talked to, uh, me and the, uh, medical student who was helping me with the session and just said, wow, that was, that was so strange, so powerful. I'm even embarrassed to talk about it a little bit because she became, uh, a character in this show. Do you know the show Vampire Diaries? Yeah. Have you heard of it? <laughs> sure. uh, okay. <laughs> She was the main character in that, and the other characters were people in her life trying to help her, protect her, her, oh. her family and friends, and, and she had this overall sense of feeling loved. Uh, and so there were dangers, there were challenges, but there was love surrounding her and support, and she f it was an embodied knowing of that. And then uh, ketamine can get... Uh, even stranger as the journey progresses. So then she became this spinning Christmas ornament, this glowing orb of light uh, that was floating around. Um, she said it was something like a Maleficent or uh, Sleeping Beauty scene. But then she heard her mother's voice that said, you're beautiful, you're enough, you're worth it, you're talented. Um, so that's when like time stood still. She was part of everything. She could feel that, that pure love flowing. Um, so it was a really touching experience just, uh, just the other week. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting how you, that you ex experience a moment where you really can experience other feelings that are not your normal kind of setup. If you just, uh, let's say in, in her case, like, um, like feel not enough, feel not skinny enough, maybe or anything. And I, actually, I just uh, there was just a study on ketamine a couple of days ago. I read uh, from Basel, I think from a Basel uh, laboratory or scientist um, that it makes actually ketamine therapy would actually people hate themselves way less than if they 
had before in a way if they feel like they're depressed and they just hate themselves and just find themselves super embarrassing. So, <clears throat> but I find interesting what you just described because it's like how mm, a lot of people and some people I talk to, including myself, like have this experience that always starts with a kind of a movie character <laughs> or a TV show. And then you're that character and through that character you get into the I don't know, the question or the feeling you would like to resolve and everything. And it also shows like how your brain is such an incredible place where mm -hmm. things are way more happening than you th that we think the whole day. So, I mean, I had like, I started mm. with a big jungle book experience in the first session and uh <laughs> yeah i actually met this what, what's the what's the bad guy again in jungle book like um shir khan the tiger right mm -hmm. and then i remember saying to the therapist i need more information about shir khan because he's so bad but i need more information about him and it was like we almost i i even remember like laughing because it was so weird but it led me exactly to the question i had about myself later on so i mean I just think it's really fascinating. But um, there's also something in, in the States already uh, that you can use the, I mean, we, we can't, we can't, I think we can't access it here yet in, in Europe or in Germany. But this uh, mm -hmm. nasal spray, this ketamine nasal spray called Spravado, right? So uh, can you talk a little bit about this, What how this works and how this could be a really big tool in, in the future in psychotherapy because you can also have it at home. It means you don't have to go into a practice, at a, which is not so easy at the, at the moment in, in these times. Sure. Yeah, I would be happy to chat about that and and how it works in the U.S. because it's uh, it's very much available and very regulated, very regimented mm -hmm. on how it can be given right now. But to... Back up and for context, uh, ketamine, for years I've been using it in a nasal spray form, in a lozenge form, injection, IV, uh, all those forms in clinic or at home. Um, personally, I will take someone through in-office ketamine journeys first before I'll send them home with any doses. Um, mm -hmm. And I'll make sure that they have a support person, say a spouse, uh, mm -hmm. a responsible uh parent or someone like that who can sit with them, who can be available, who I've met, who, who we've provided some basic skills to. Um, but mm -hmm. then last year, in early 2019 in the U.S., the FDA approved Spravato, which is a cleaned up version of ketamine, one of the two enantiomers. It's S-ketamine instead of R-ketamine. Mm -hmm. And that's only in nasal spray form. Uh, and it's only allowed to be given in office. Very strict rules. You have to stay in office for two hours and it can't be taken home. And it costs about $1,000 a dose, where if wow. I would would have someone take home a nasal spray, that would cost less than a dollar a dose. No, mm -hmm. no problem. But what this does um, is it opens up insurance coverage for ketamine treatments for psychedelic medicine essentially and so since then even though it's expensive ketamine wasn't covered by insurance at all the regular ketamine but spravato is if you have treatment resistant depression so we've given it to well over a thousand people since it came out and uh, every one of them not only has it been covered by their insurance but uh, if they had any copay with that for the medicine the company paid for all of that uh, because it's a new medicine and they have a program for that. Okay. So, but that means like the next generation who will have to resolve mental health problems, meaning that, I mean, you could even say now Generation Z, I guess are they called, or even millennials, they will probably have a very different scenario in using psychedelics uh, and also meaning that taking care of their mental health problems way earlier Mm -hmm. Then let's say people who are now in their 40s, 50s and just have to sometimes, I mean, now they can go to Oregon and <laughs> Washington mm -hmm. or to, to the Netherlands, but still like the 
the places where you could actually do a legal psychedelic experience is a very limited it's still at this point or, or very expensive. So do you see there's already like a generational change um, in people like younger people in their 20s, 30s being way more open already to psychedelic treatments? Oh yeah, it's it's huge and it's long overdue. I have uh I have children, um five children actually from five. A- wow. ages 11 to 21. <laughs> wow. And and their their generation is embracing mental health in a way that I think is really neat. You know, therapy used to be a taboo subject, mm-hmm. but now it's almost it's it's almost cool. It's almost, uh, wow, you're working on yourself. Uh, oh, I like my therapist. Uh, so the stigma is getting addressed. We have mm-hmm. a long way to go, but that was such, it has traditionally been such a barrier to treatment, uh, that, uh, at least the new generation is embracing this. And I do see patterns in who is reaching out, already asking about ketamine, uh, psychedelic medicine mm-hmm. studies, uh, in the newer generations, um, much more than the older, but that being said, um, I have, uh, I have gotten the, uh, pleasure of watching my family members. Even my mother had a ketamine treatment for pain. Wow. My brother, uh, sought one out in clinic as well. And, uh, the tides are turning for all generations, um, mm-hmm. you know, young and old, to embrace these tools for healing. I mean, I mean, this is like always the, the, the big topic that has a little bit now changed since the last couple of days, because obviously so many people would like to have the possibility to go to a psychedelic therapy, at least in two states. But as we know, this is going to be progressing fast, at least in America. Mm-hmm. So, but I mean, what do you think is, is a really good thing to take the stigma away because I mean like with all the podcasts with all the conversations I have it's always pretty much the same kind of yeah context that you say okay the science is there the need is there the numbers are rising but still the one thing that still has to be kind of peeled away from this is the Yeah, stigmatization, because mm-hmm. uh, I'm sure if you would walk outside your door and you would tell people, hey, why don't you do like a guided LSD session? Like 80% would tell you, oh my God, I would never do this. Or like, are you crazy? Like, I'm not going to do drugs or something. So what what is in your um, experience, what is the the most effective thing to destigmatize psychedelics? Mm-hmm. Oh, I I've thought a lot about this question. And in fact, uh, earlier this year, in January, before this pandemic really hit us, uh, we put on a a psychedelics conference here in Utah. And Mm -hmm. we thought it would be a small interest group meeting of a handful of people. (laughs) But, you know, it sold out at five, six hundred individuals. And I was in my... uh, you know, last minute fashion was preparing some slides for my talk at this meeting the night before. Mm -hmm. And I was dancing around some of the personal experiences like I would often do. But then I had this realization. I was like, why would I not share my story uh, with ayahuasca or what my ketamine experience was years ago, especially when these were done in legal prescribable settings. Like I go outside of the country where I can and work with ayahuasca in retreat settings. Here we'll do MDMA studies in the U.S. and yeah. maybe next year we'll prescribe it. Um, ketamine, you know, we give it in clinic, we send it home, but uh, we do it in ways that are 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 and should be perfectly acceptable and that people should know about. So I got up there, threw out all my slides, got up there and just told some stories and and thought that we need to talk more about our mental health. We need to talk mm-hmm. more about our experiences. We need to uh, open up the conversation about these things. And uh, so that's what I think needs to happen. More authentic, real uh, connection, vulnerability and openness around these topics. Yeah, that's, I mean, I feel also this is the best tool besides validation systems like Yale and Harvard and Stanford and 
<laughs> mm-hmm. telling everybody who did already a study, because as you know, most people, like 50% of people would already look at this differently. If you tell them, well, Yale, um, <laughs> Yale doctors are a big fan of ketamine. <laughs> so <laughs> it's always yeah. like this thing. But I mean, does that mean, so you have, you by yourself did an ayahuasca ceremony, like recently or in the last years? Yeah, I started working with ayahuasca last year, and okay. uh, as pretty much a prerequisite for working as a, a therapist and a medical support person in retreat, I needed to experience it myself. I needed yeah. to know what that's like so I can uh, help others through it. So before that, leading up to that, I had my first uh, ayahuasca experiences and have uh, several times since um whether it's uh, tied to some work I'm doing therapeutically for groups or individuals or families, or even just seeking it out for my own work. I'm a big believer mm-hmm. in, you know, that as, as therapists, as practitioners, we need to do our own work. We can only take someone as deep as we've gone ourselves. Mm-hmm, totally. You know, we can only hold their suffering if we're not afraid of ours. Um, mm, definitely. So, and was it something you... That ch- I mean, that obviously that changed you as a person, as a scientist, also a doctor. Yeah, it it certainly did. I I went to the jungle seeking like a new tool for my patients, but definitely got more than I bargained for, and and uh, got some answers to questions, existential questions I didn't even know I had, or saw another side of the coin that. I might not have even been looking for, but Mm -hmm. for me personally, the big, the big thing that came out of it for me, and there were many, is um, just a a renewed vigor in my own spirituality. Um, Because as a scientist, as a as a Western trained medical doctor, Mm I had thrown uh, the baby out with the bathwater a little bit in my uh, scientific explorations in my academic uh, path. Uh, so that sense of, uh, of knowing, seeing, feeling one's place in the universe and all the, these unseen energies about us and, uh, the interconnectedness of all things, the natural rhythms of, of life. It was, it was very profound for me. Uh, and I remember coming back, uh, on a boat from this, uh, ayahuasca, ceremony location, uh, preparing to get on my plane home. And I said to uh, a friend and colleague on the ride back, you know, never again will I give even ketamine without uh, ceremony uh, attached to it or and without mm-hmm. intention. Interesting. So it means that means like you took the the part of the ayahuasca ceremony and kind of implemented it in your ketamine treatment, which yeah. I find a very great thing to do actually because otherwise it's just like a substance running through your system and then that's mm-hmm. it kind and of. then it's gone you know it might be yeah. helpful temporarily but yeah. to make things stick i really believe that there needs to be uh you know ceremony ritual there needs to be intention and there needs to be mm-hmm. integration mm-hmm. so what, what do you think i mean since now a lot of ketamine clinics are opening shortly also before COVID, but uh, like Field Trip has a great network already of of clinics. So, I mean, how do you think this is going to look like in a couple of years, the the, the ketamine situation? Because I mean, even if it's a lot about decriminalization at this point, it's still a way to go until this will be implemented Mm -hmm. in a regular therapy context. Yeah. Yeah, I... uh... I think ketamine is such a great stepping stone to psychedelic medicine more broadly because it's a new way of practicing psychiatry or mental health uh, Mm -hmm. that sometimes uh, I'll call interventional psychiatry where there's an in-office treatment Uh uh, that's delivered or there's therapy tied to a substance that is new for both uh, prescribers and therapists. Um, So ketamine lets us... uh, roll out that infrastructure and get set up to do that 
or pave the way for these other tools um, with other uses, uh, maybe even more powerful, like uh, MDMA, psilocybin, and other things coming down the pipeline. Um, mm -hmm. So ketamine, uh, I think more training is needed, certainly around the psychotherapy. Uh, but I think it's great that this is becoming more widely uh, accessible, that clinics are opening up, as long as they do it uh, in uh, a way that is uh, safe and that you know, really takes care of the individual. And I strongly believe that ketamine needs to be paired with psychotherapy as well. Yeah, it's a good idea, I think. <laughs> well, I'm excited for my next treatment next week. Um, and I think it's a great tool to really support your, your therapy. I mean, I can really imagine that in a couple of years, or um, next year, I don't know, like when maybe more people need therapy than ever mm -hmm. after COVID. Um, I think it, it's really a great tool, actually. Also, I mean, even if you mm -hmm. add some ceremonial aspects to it, it's just something that is just very, I'm, I'm not going to say easy to use, but it's very um, easy to implement into psychotherapy. I mean, to me, it yeah. doesn't seem like a big problem. So um, thank you very much. That was great. I hope you have a still a beautiful morning in Utah. It seems like the sun is shining. <laughs> Like yeah, yeah, it, it's uh, shaping <laughs> up to be a nice day. Um, okay. How has your ketamine experience been overall, by the way? I've just been curious if, if that's been a really positive thing for yeah, you. Yeah, I mean, it's the first it. one. The first treatment was we took it a little slow and it was really something. I mean, like you say, it's like hard to explain. It's like somebody puts like a very, like a cement kind of <laughs> substance in your veins and you're very heavy and you're like, but you, but you're still there. You're not kind of knocked out. Mm -hmm. So, and then all I can say is that all the three experiences were, each one was very different from the other one. And uh, they were all related to, um, <laughs> Like I said earlier, to movie scenes or to movie characters mm. or to, I mean, I'm a big movie fan. And like, I mean, I, I know a lot of movies and I watch a lot of TV shows, but it's interesting how this seems to be implemented in our brains today, like characters of a mm -hmm. TV show that we just like to watch or like or movies that we liked or grew up with. So, I mean, I, I did like also for personal reasons, but also because like you did ayahuasca for getting into this topic. I did in last February, I did a psilocybin experience in, at Synthesis in, in Amsterdam. Mm. And I mean, I think this is, to be honest, this is my favorite psychedelic maybe because I thought I really got so much out of this but it's mm -hmm. a very different thing of course because you can't just walk out after it i mean you can yeah. but you, you better <laughs> don't <laughs> and you basically spent the weekend like you know implementing it and then into integrate it and stuff so but i mean with ketamine i think that it's like it's like a meeting you meet yourself in a different way again like mm -hmm. And this is yeah. the great thing. And you meet a person that you haven't met yet. That's what would be my short, short elevator pitch for Catherine. That's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. So, sounds like the hero's journey, your your movie yeah. character examples, yeah. you know, life's a journey. But but on. one thing, yeah. uh, one thing I realized, although it's COVID and it's, I mean, we're in a lockdown situation here and everything. So, but still... Like an, there's an underlying thing that came out of the three th treatments that made me like less like I don't have I don't feel like a heaviness. I just can mm. laugh at really stupid things like even when I'm not on ketamine, like mm -hmm. also off ketamine, and like there's a level of lightness I would say after I started the yeah. treatment. Then that's I can I can hardly explain it. It's not like. Oh, I'm also in, always in a good mood, like all the time, and I make jokes all day. But it's kind of an underlying lightness that came out of this so far. Yeah, uh, no, I think that's a very uh, eloquent way of describing it, and and I think it lines up with what the scientific literature shows too—that mm -hmm. ketamine mm -hmm. can 
rapidly turn off this overstressed out state that's called mm -hmm. lateral habenular burst mode that's just overactive in stress, anxiety, depression. Turns it off. Okay. It doesn't last forever, but it gives you some lightness, a way of doing other work or working on yourself or greeting yourself in a new way. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think the like next year, if this all is over, I mean, I would like to engage in another psilocybin experience. But again, like look, looking at it as a journey in a way that um, I just keep, um, I'm just kind of started this journey of answering some questions that, as you said, I didn't know I even had. Mm -hmm. But Right now, it's also, and this is what we also, that's why we also do this ketamine special, because people can do this right now. And it's not an illegal thing. You can find, um, I mean, in Germany, you can actually undertake this in a couple of hospitals that they already start to offer ketamine therapy. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is what we also going to communicate when we run the show, that it's really a possibility um, if you have a really big challenge right now that you could do this. So, and you would, you wouldn't do anything illegal with this. Yeah. It's a great tool for that. Thank you so much. It was very interesting. New, new, uh, new kind of, uh, insights on ketamine. We put them all together <laughs> in, in the shows in, in November and, uh, have a beautiful day in, in Utah. I've never been there. Unfortunately, I wanted to go to, uh, Sundance, but it didn't last time. It didn't work out. Yeah. So maybe um, next year. Uh, next year. <laughs> uh, it's been great <laughs> Definitely. chatting with you. Thank you. Have a good day. You See too. you soon on the next show and um, have a great weekend and okay. fingers crossed for the rest. <laughs> yeah. Take care. All right. Bye. Bye.